All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Justin. Uh, welcome to tonight's program, The Story of Paisley and How to Draw It, as part of our Discover India series. Uh, this program is a series brought to you through a partnership between the India Association of Greater Boston, uh, the Shushi Bharati School, and the Burlington Public Library, with the participation of public libraries in Acton, Andover, Clinton, Marlboro, Tewksbury, and Westford. I'd like to thank our members of the Indian Association of Greater Boston, Veena Kumar, our presenter for the night, for the generous donation of their time and knowledge uh, for this series to happen. Um, we hope you enjoy tonight's program, uh, so much so that you bring your friends along to our next one, uh, which will be on Monday, May 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, it'll be about the Bengal Tiger. Uh, tonight's program will be a presentation followed by a Q&A uh, session. In order to ask your questions, please, please feel free to do so at any time using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and your questions will be answered at the end of the program uh, as time allows. And joining me is Nilish, who will introduce our speaker. Uh, here over to Nilish. Thank you, Justin. Hello, all. My name is uh, Nilesh Agrawal, Director of India Association of Greater Boston, IGB. On behalf of IGB, I would like to thank Burlington Public Library and all other partners, uh, libraries, and special thanks to Sheshubarthi School and their teachers for supporting the Discover India series. I'm happy to introduce today's presenter and my dear friend, Vinit Kumar. Vinit Kumar is an Indian American moved from India and now settled in Lexington, MA. An engineer by training, Vinit is a lifelong teacher at heart and has been teaching Indian culture to the students of Shishubarthi School for the last 10 years and serves as a vice principal of culture at Lexington location of Shishubarthi School. Over to you, Vinit Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh. Let me just uh, share my screen. All right, welcome everybody and good evening to all. Uh, I welcome you to the third episode, a third uh, presentation for our uh, Discover India series. My name is Vineet Kumar. And today we're gonna take a hopefully enjoyable journey to learn more about the story of Paisley. So welcome aboard. So just a, a, a brief overview of what we're gonna cover today and what we're gonna accomplish. I wanted to introduce this session by saying that today, most people around the world can look at the iconic pattern that I show on the right here. And uh, let me get my uh, mouse here. So you can see this uh, pattern here and immediately recognize it and say, hey, yeah, that's the Paisley pattern. But yet only 200 years ago, this was a more or less obscure pattern known only to a few people in the Indian subcontinent as the Buta design. So let's connect the dots here. And in the first half we will learn and we'll hear the unusual story about how this pattern became quite famous and how it got its new name. And then we'll, we'll follow that with some questions and answers. And then uh, the latter half will be a, a practical demo where uh, you can grab a pencil and paper and we learn how to draw some simple versions of this pattern. Anybody can do it. If I have learned how to do this in, in the last several days, I know everybody can do it. So just make sure you have a, you have a pencil preferably, not Hello, Vinit, we, we cannot hear you. Vinit, we can't hear you. Is that better? 
Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me let me just back up a little bit here. All right. So as I was saying, 500 years ago in India, the Mughal real, Mughal emperors were ruling India, and uh, in that time period, the people of India they were quite familiar with the design pattern that sort of looked like the mango fruit that all of us know about. And this particular pattern uh, in many regional languages in India, they would give this pattern a name that resembled the mango. But yet in the Northern region of Kashmir, and I have a little map here, and this is the, nor this is the map of India. And in the Northern region of uh, India called Kashmir, uh, which is next to the Himalayas. Himalayas are, are kind of around this area. So in this kingdom, in this region, there were many creative artists who were making beautiful creative artistic objects using this pattern that they called locally the Buddha pattern. And we will dive further into that. But I thought I would show you some pictures from 200 years ago about these patterns which the artists in this region were using to decorate various objects. So let's take a look. So this was a picture I found on the web uh, from about uh, you know, early 1800s. Here's another picture of the same uh, similar pattern. And when you look at these pictures, it's quite clear that these patterns, these Buddha patterns that they, the locals used to call them, they resemble the modern day Paisley quite uh, closely. All right, so once we have established that, you know, these patterns were in play and artists were using them, let's take the story forward. Now, the emperors of the region of India, they encouraged these artists who lived in this region of Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir is a region which closely resembles the New England region. It's cold, it's near the Himalayas. Winter time, there's a lot of time. Artists have you know, not much to do. So a lot of art and craft exists. And these artists would do many things with these patterns. So what do you think they use them for? Some might argue maybe tattoos, maybe they build some vases, maybe they decorated their homes with it. Yes, they did that. But there was one very prominent usage that I'd like to share. The people of the region would use these patterns to make very nice woolen shawls. Now, you might ask what exactly is a shawl and maybe we have young kids in the audience who may not have seen one. So what is a shawl? A shawl is like a cloak, something that you wrap around your upper body. So here you see this uh, lady has a shawl around her upper body. It provides warmth, it's like a cloak. And uh, some of it is to keep warm and some of it might be to, uh, you know, for, for a fashion accessory. So shawls were quite common and people would wear them. Now, these particular shawls that uh, I'm referring to, they were quite fancy and expensive and uh, they would have these very interesting patterns on them. But because they were very fancy and expensive, only royalty could buy them. So typically the audience for purchase were kings. And once the king would buy a few of these, the king would give these shawls as gifts to other kings or his friends or other important people who would visit his kingdom. And these important people would perhaps wear them like a cloak of honor during important ceremonies, during important events. So you could say it was almost like a, like a status symbol. Now, it's quite obvious from that statement that these were mostly meant to be worn by men. And if you are interested in seeing a picture of a very fancy shawl from a couple of hundred years ago, let me share one. So this was a picture I found of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, like a fancier version of a shawl made in the 1800s by the craftsmen who lived in this uh, northern region of Kashmir. It's quite pretty. And you'll see some bright colors and uh, nice patterns. And you can see the Paisley pattern in there uh, as well. At that time, of course, they called it the Buddha pattern. All right, now we're gonna take a little pause 
and have a little quiz. And our friend Justin is going to uh, activate the quiz in just a moment. But I'm going to just uh, uh, ask you uh, to think about how long do you think a craftsman would take to hand weave a fancy shawl? That's one question. And also, what was the fabric or fiber used to make these shawls? So there are two questions in here. So I welcome the audience to pick their choices and uh, submit them. There are two questions. And then we will uh, take a look at the answers. So Justin, we'll, we'll monitor the, the updates as, as uh, the audience submits their answers. Our audience is quite bright. I'm hopeful they can get the right answer. So maybe we'll give them 10, 15 seconds to submit their answers. So uh, let's just monitor if everybody is turning in their answers. Yeah, we got about half of people. We can... All right, excellent. So there are two questions. How long do you think it took to make this particular shawl? And also the second question was, uh, what do you think it was made up of? Or, or, or what, in, what uh, fiber or material was used to make it? So let's do a little countdown. Folks can turn it in. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, time's up. So Justin, do you want to see uh, what the audience uh, came up with? And maybe you can share the results of the survey. Yep, there we go. All right, so let's take a look. So the first question was, how long did it take? Well, folks thought it would take several months to almost a year. And then what fabric was used? A uh, little mixed bag, uh, maybe wool and silk were the choices. All right, that's good. So I will share the answers in just a moment, but uh, please note what your answer was. So uh, let's keep going. So there were two questions. Uh, okay, so let's share the answers and learn a little bit about it. Now, keep in mind these shawls that I'm talking about are quite large. So they are like full body size, right? So that helps paint some uh, perspective here. So answers. So how long did it take for a Kashmiri artist to hand weave a shawl? The right answer is six months to a year. So it took a while. And the reason it took a while was because the patterns were intricate and a full body length shawl of the kind this model is wearing took a while. What fabric was used to make these shawls? Very interesting question. The right answer is, it's actually the wool from the mountain goats who roam the high altitudes of Himalayas. And these goats are called the Pashmina goats. I've shown a picture of these. They live about uh, 4,000 meters, uh, which is about 10,000 foot above sea level. So really up there. And because it's very cold, these goats, they, they have to have a very thick uh, fur. And uh, after the winter is over, every March, uh, you know, they, they shed their wool. They, they rub against the side of the mountain and, and, and then the wool falls off. And of course, people gather them and uh, then you can make it into something. And they say you need the, the fur of three goats to make approximately one shawl. Now, what's special about this wool? So you can imagine. If you have to survive on the top of Mount Everest or near the top of uh, the Himalayas, you need to have some very good insulation. So the, this wool is incredibly warm and incredibly light. That means it is, it's not very heavy at all. And it's got a very great, very good natural gloss to it. And uh, the word Pashmina, it's a local word. It means soft gold. And it is so soft and uh, light that uh, it passes a very unique test that may surprise some of you. So you can imagine you have the size, a shawl the size of uh, maybe a good sized bed sheet, you know, something full body length. And if you have a wedding ring, you know, a ring that you wear in your finger, uh, the, the whole shawl can pass through your wedding ring. So you might say, how is that possible? So I'm gonna show you a quick video that I found on the internet, which has um, uh, uh, someone showing you how it is done. And uh, so I'm gonna play this video in just a moment. So this is the shawl 
that this person has, Ashmina shawl. And you'll see this little wedding ring. Uh, and this lady is going to try to put the shawl through this wedding ring. And let's take a look if that is possible. So there you go. So you can see it's possible. And actually, that's how soft it is. So those who are really into fabrics and whatnot, they believe that the, the, this particular wool is one of the most uh, uh, lightest, uh, softest, and uh, smoothest fabric uh, that uh, has ever been uh, made. So now, these shawls, they begin to become global. And actually, the reason they became very famous all around the world is two reasons and two separate events. Let's talk about that. The first event was there was an Indian king who actually gave some British officers who were in India some gifts uh, of these shawls. So these British officers had them. And then, of course, uh, em Emperor Napoleon, all of us know about that in history uh, of France, he was conquering Egypt and Africa. In the 1800s, uh, you know, when you conquer some lands, you get precious things, you plunder certain things. And he laid his hands on some very precious Indian made Kashmiri Buddha shawls, which were owned by the king of Egypt. And when he plundered that area, or he conquered that land, he got these things and he said, what is this? And he loved it. And these two, you could say events led to something where I would say, fortuitously, these British men and Napoleon, they had these precious objects that they got. So let's ask the question, what do you think they did? Do you think the men wore the shawl themselves? It was not the normal kind of attire for uh, Europeans. Or do you think they sent them back as presents to their wives who were in Europe? In the case of uh, Emperor Napoleon, he sent, his, uh, he sent those shawls to his wife, Josephine, and these British officers sent them to their wives who were in Europe. Of course, the answer is they send them back to their wives in Europe, and let's see what happened thereafter. So there's this famous picture. Actually, it's not a picture, it's a painting. In those days, there were no cameras. So this is a picture of the wife of Napoleon wearing the shawl with the uh, paisley pattern on it. And when she did that, you know, she was like royalty or not like her, she was royalty. So when royalty had a fashion statement to make, everybody said, wow, what is that? So this is a, a, a picture, a painting from uh, way in the past. And of course, when British officers sent back similar shawls to their wives, their wives loved them. And very soon these shawls became a major fashion craze. And a lot of women who were fashion conscious, they wanted to lay their hands on one. All right, so second quiz, and uh, Justin will, will trigger that in, in, in 10 seconds here. So the question was, when thousands of European women desperately wanted to get a Kashmiri Buddha shawl, what do you think they did? Did they write a letter to the craftsmen to work harder and weave more? Or they waited? Or did they try to figure out if they could get a decent replica made locally? So. I welcome everybody to take a look at the question and share what they felt uh, was the best possible choice for all the uh, you know, fashion conscious ladies of Europe. So we'll give you 10 seconds to think about it and enter in your answers. Let's do a countdown. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's lock in the answers. And Justin, do you want to share what uh, everybody felt was the right answer? Oh, yeah, an overwhelming majority. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, that's a good answer, I know. You know sometimes you want a, a very expensive, fashionable bag, maybe a Gucci bag or something really fashionable or something, you can't get it. Yeah, you, you kind of think, hey, can I get a replica for somewhere around me? So 
You're exactly right. So that was the thinking by many people. All right, so now let's think about how to make a replica. So for more than about 50 years, European weavers tried their best to copy this pattern. The shawls make it very nice, but uh, they were not successful. They failed quite badly. But also this was the era of industrial revolution in Europe and many inventions were taking place. And I show a picture of uh, uh, something which is associated with the Jacquard loom. This was a semi-automatic way of weaving cloth patterns uh, on, on, on automated equipment or semi-automated equipment with punched cards. So these cards would contain some information about the patterns and weavers could use these punch cards long before there was a computer. And this loom did something that uh, made life easier for a lot of people who wanted to weave complicated patterns. So now finally, factories could do more complicated patterns. So what do you think? What was the one of the big targets of many European weavers? Of course, they wanted to make these kind of complicated patterns uh, of the same kind that the Kashmiri artists of India were doing. So the first success came about, uh, there was a Scottish trader who worked very hard to make such replicas. He even got a few craftsmen from Kashmir to train these automatic looms so that he could uh, create a, a, a recipe and make them. And after he spent a few years doing it, he thought he had a decent recipe. He decided, the trader decided to make a few as trial. And what do you think? Do you think he was successful? Could he make something that looked even remotely close to the complicated patterns? The answer is yes. Even though they were not perfect, replicas came out somewhat okay. So he was very happy. And this trader decided to start a tiny factory where he could make a few of these shawls regularly. All right, so let's move forward. So the question for the audience is, where do you think this trader set up a tiny factory with a few machines to make replicas of Indian Kashmiri shawls? Was it the fashion capitals of the world? Was it London? Was it Paris? Was it Milan? Was it Italy? Or was it Scotland, uh, Glasgow? So you can think about it. And the, I will give you the answer. This is not really a quiz. It turns out that uh, this trader decided to set up his tiny little factory in a small village in Scotland, which is a country near England. And do you know what the name of this village was? Well, I'll give it to you. So the name of the village where he set up this little factory was Tada, Paisley. So this village is where he set up his factory. And this factory was uh, very well documented. This shawl factory in Paisley, Scotland. They started making these Indian Buddha shawls. And with automatic looms, they could make a few every month. And maybe they were not as great and perfect as the Indian handmade versions, but they were pretty decent and relatively cheap. So you have these old pictures and images of uh, how this factory looked like. Uh, many workers working there. And uh, if you go online, you can read more about it. And it became so popular that people from all over Europe would actually visit this village just to buy the shawl. And it became like a touristy destination to go buy a expensive shawl. And over 10, 20 years, the Paisley Shawl Factory became so famous that people soon began to call this shawl the Paisley Shawl. And the rest is history, my friends. So in 50 years, the people in Europe almost forgot that the shawl made in this little village called Paisley was actually an imitation of the Indian Buddha shawl. And when people would see the shawl, they really were not quite aware of the background and the story behind it. And even the wonderful patterns that these artists would now make on the, on the hand loom were called as the Paisley pattern. In, re in, in reality, it is not the Paisley pattern. Paisley is the name of the village where this was made, but because it became so famous, so people would say, I just want the shawl with that pattern. And, and very soon, everybody called it the Paisley pattern. So even today, most people around the world who see this iconic pattern, they may not really know the story and we call it the Paisley pattern, but Paisley was the name of the village where these replicas were made. 
And today the Paisley pattern is seen everywhere. Whether you want some very fancy shoes, designer shoes with a pattern, you can get them. Or uh, neckwear, men's clothing with uh, Paisley patterns or uh, women's fashion attire, or even home patterns, home goods with, with the Paisley pattern. You see them just about everywhere. So the Paisley pattern could be viewed as a gift to the world from India. And uh, in case you hadn't noticed, so some of you may be very familiar with the, with the cashmere, spelt with a C-A-S-H-M-E-R-E, precious wool. It's a very soft kind of wool. It's a westernized name for the same region in India called Kashmir, where this wool, this is another kind of wool, which is very common and very popular, very soft wool. Its name comes from the same region as Kashmir, where the Buddha pattern and the Paisley comes from. So just in case you are curious, I thought I would share that with you. So that, my friends, is the story of Paisley part one. I will pause here and we can take some questions and thereafter we will resume and we will uh, have a demo here. So I will stop sharing and uh, perhaps uh, take any questions that might have come about. Uh, so Justin, do you want to see if there are any questions from the audience? Absolutely. Uh, we have a couple questions here in regards to the pashmina goats. Uh, yeah. One question was, uh, do people farm pashmina goats? And if so, uh, do they shave off the wool like in the US and Europe? And does it become a fleece in quotes? Yes. So uh, in my limited little research that I did, of course, in, in the days past, uh, uh, these goats were you know, running wild and they were found in high altitude. So one problem is it's difficult to farm things when you are that high up in the mountains, right? So uh, my, my sense was that there are some farms which actually do occur, but they, have, they are in Mongolia now. So Mongolia is a high altitude region and there are flatlands there. So there are some people who do farm them there. And of course, then you can shave off the, 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 the fur, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in a more regular basis. But uh, otherwise it is still very difficult to, to get them. All right, and another question regards to the pashmina shawls, uh, but they're now very common in the markets around the world and not terribly expensive. Uh, are they no longer made by hand? Um, is that true? And if, are they still made from pashmina goats? Right, so the way I, 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 I kind of think about this is that uh, the mountain goats of the Himalayas and these high altitude goats in Central Asia, be it in Tibet, be it in Mongolia, be it in India, be it somewhere else, uh, there are three or four kinds of goats, and some of the goats, they create this wool, which is used for cashmere. And there is one specific one, which is even lighter in its weight, and that's the pashmina goats. Uh, what I understand is that the, the, the wool of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of this particular goat is very fine. It is a very thin fiber. So in the past, the machinery and equipment that was used to kind of uh, grab it and, and thread it and all that was very harsh and it would break. So only by doing it by hand were the artists able to make it. But with sophistication in technology, uh, my guess is there, there is some finer techniques which allow you to handle very delicate wool. So that probably has eased the burden. So I'm sure today, there is more technology involved than in the past. Okay, another question was, uh, does Buddha translate into a, an English word? I, I suppose. So, so Buddha is, uh, is, uh, is like a bud, like a flower. And they say the origins come from like some Persian language as well, uh, where it was believed to be the, the source of life or something like that. Uh, it doesn't have an English equivalent, but uh, Buta uh, in many regional languages could mean something like a, like a flower bud, something that looks like an unopened bud, something like that. I believe the origins of the word may have some Persian mixed into it. 
Okay, on the, another question was in regards to the fakes made, uh, were they from the same species of goat or of something different? No, no, so it, it was, uh, you know, uh, one of the challenges was this wool was very difficult to get, right? So they probably use some substitute, but sometimes when all you're looking for is the wonderful pattern, perhaps, you know, they, they would print it on silk or they would, they would find some other substitute because this wool was very difficult to get. So I'm not quite sure exactly what they use, but for sure it wouldn't have been this rare wool. Another question was uh, the origin of the Paisley uh, Buddha design itself. Um, was there any representation, I guess, from that in nature or what was the uh, inspiration to it? Right. So um, I think uh, when I did my little bit of research, what I found is the very older patterns, you know, the patterns in the 1800s, they resembled a few of the pictures that I was showing you. Over time, what has happened is artists take creative liberties, right? So they might say, hey, I don't like this shape. I'm going to make it a little flatter, a little narrower. I'm going to fill it with some other colors. My guess is uh, there are now millions and millions of versions of the Paisley pattern. You can fill it with any pattern that you like. So it has evolved a little bit, but the very older patterns uh, from you know a couple of hundred years ago, there are not many around, so I can't really tell, but I shared a couple of pictures. They look floral in nature with some flowers and things like that. Another question was, are these still being made in uh, the kingdom of Kashmir? Yes, so people still make it. Uh, like I said, it is, it is a, a great touristy destination. Uh, it's very beautiful uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it's mountainous. It looks like uh, the Swiss Alps, that sort of thing. And it's a little, little bit cold. And the people there, you know, like I said, they, they, it resembles New England like weather, you know, it's cold. So people are indoors in the winter times. They, they, they make these kinds of crafts and arts and whatnot. And uh, they still make it. But perhaps the techniques have evolved uh, to make it a little bit faster and more economical. That would be my guess. Uh, is Buddha related to mango? So uh, interesting question. So what I find is that uh, there are other Indian vocabulary words which describe this pattern and they all sound like in other parts of the country. They are um, synonyms for a young mango, you know, something like that. So my guess is the shape looks somewhat like a mango, but it's not a mango. So sometimes, you know, the, the, the word gets, uh, the pattern gets uh, regional names. So there are some names for this particular pattern in local Indian dialects, which, which sound like mango or which, which tell you that it's like a young mango pattern, but it is not a mango. It may have just been like a, like a, like a given name uh, for ease of communication. Uh, this one is uh, interesting because uh, I believe it is the case. Uh, are the Buddha designs used in henna decorations that people do on skin? Of course, of course. So they are, uh, henna is a way of making patterns, uh, uh, tattoos, uh, temporary tattoos on your hand. So a, a Buddha pattern, or today you could call it the Paisley pattern is very popular. And uh, of course, uh, when in, in, in India, the time where everybody puts on the henna uh, designs uh, on their hands and even their feet uh, and lower ankles and all that is during weddings. So you might frequently find uh, an artist who is very good. Uh, he or she will come in with their, you know, with their henna and everybody who's attending the wedding will get their hands and palms and whatnot uh, done, not necessarily only the bride, uh, uh, even the bridesmaids and the family members. So very popular and, and it Paisley or the Buddha pattern is one of the patterns. You could get other patterns as well made. And another uh, question here, uh, kind of a combo between a couple. Um, are the goats random uh, that they just end up finding? Or are they more, I guess, uh, from the same goat as in like sort of a farm kind of uh, controlled environment and do people uh, are they allergic to the pashmina and cashmere wool? Uh, right. So uh, the the allergy part, uh, it's, a, it's a fair question. I'm afraid I'm not quite sure 
um, uh, I'm sure you know there might be somebody who might have an allergy, but this this pashmina um, uh, cloak or or the shawl is very light, so it, it doesn't rub against your body. So sometimes what might happen is on a winter day, uh, you might be well dressed, so it perhaps doesn't touch your skin. Maybe you you have some other clothing or a shirt or something else, and you wear it on top of that. So perhaps that mitigates it. But I I feel it's possible that. You know, there are people who have uh, were sensitive to certain kinds of wool, so it's possible that happens. But uh, the first part of the question was, you know, a little bit about the goats. Uh, my guess is, high altitude goats, uh, they uh, they have this particular very light, very warm wool, and there are three or four breeds. And pashmina, is that kind of particular goat, it has a scientific name. I don't remember that, but uh, they are considered to be the lightest, warmest, also because their fibers are the thinnest. You know, they're very slender, maybe 15, 17 microns, uh, which is considered very thin. D did I answer that question? Uh, yes, I believe you did. Yeah. yeah. All right, and that's all we have for questions at the moment. If anyone else in the audience does uh, have anything they'd like to add, uh, question-wise, we have the meat. Sure. So excellent questions, uh, dear friends, and, and looks like everybody, uh, you know, uh, got into it. I, I, I value the, 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 the sort of questions that everybody is asking. I certainly found it very interesting. But what we'll do is in order to kind of uh, keep our schedule. Yeah, we are on time uh, running two minutes late. OK, that's fine. So what we'll do next is I will begin the next part of the journey and uh, share with you uh, a demo. All right, can everybody see my screen? Uh, Justin, you can see my screen, right? Yep, perfect. Okay, perfect. So over the next 20, 25 minutes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn how to draw the Paisley pattern, simple Paisley patterns. And remember, you don't have to be an expert. Like when I started practicing it, I had no idea, I'd never drawn one. And within a few days, I got pretty good at it. So I'm sure you'll pick it up very quickly. So some simple do's and don'ts. Uh, I would suggest have a blank piece of paper to draw on. And uh, please try to have a pencil uh, that you can use. I, I, I avoid the ballpoint and, and there's a specific reason for that because the ballpoint is quite smooth. And for a beginner, it is a little difficult to control the pattern. So I advise, you know, using the pencil. And in the same way, even after I got a little bit good at it, few days of practicing, when I'm doing this demo, I'm going to be using an iPad with a, with a little pencil, you know, iPad pencil. And what I found is it is a lot harder to draw it on a very slick surface. So just keep that in mind. A uh, couple of other suggestions. What size should I draw the Paisley? I would say at the lower end, it should be the size of a penny. At the upper end, it should be the size of a quarter. You know, feel comfortable to draw whatever size you like, but it shouldn't be monstrous and, lar and large. So it would be somewhere, maybe three quarters of an inch uh, or, or so half an inch, somewhere in that neighborhood. And how long to get pretty good at it? The first one or two days would be slow, but I would say I got very good at it after a week. So I would say if you have drawn for an hour or two, you will become quite proficient. So uh, don't lose heart. And how long does it take to draw one? A couple of minutes, less than five minutes. And if it's more intricate, it takes maybe more than a few minutes. And keep practicing. In your free time, if you keep doodling it, uh, very soon you'll get very good at it. And likewise, I just said, during this demo session, I'm gonna be drawing on a very slick screen. So <laughs> it may not come out very, very perfectly, but uh, we'll give it a shot. Okay. Few things, parts of the Paisley sketch. And uh, what I like to just point out is that uh, uh, we first draw the outline of the pattern. So there is a starting point and the starting point is always the tip. So you start here and then there is a outside part, convex part, you know, this outward facing slope. And then as you complete the journey, there is an inside part. And at the end, you go back home and you reach your destination, right? So that's the general theme. There's of course, you know, we may use some vocabulary. I might say the neck of the Paisley 
or the base of the paisley, you know, neck is just thin part. And of course the base is, you know, the, 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 the wider part. And throughout this today's talk, we will talk about decorating the inside. So there is some fill pattern. You can also decorate the outside. This is the, 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 the outside. And then you will also, we'll make some borders here. So we will try to decorate every aspect of the base. Okay. So now uh, let's start, have your pencils and, and, and paper ready. And, 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 and what I'm gonna do is I have maybe seven or eight pages or so. And every page I will show you a simple scale and then you can keep practicing. So first thing is think of the Paisley as a messed up number six. So I show this, uh, uh, this like an eight like shape and then a six like shape. So think of the Paisley as a messed up six. So what do I mean by that? So let me sketch here and you can just uh, uh, listen to it and then try it on your own. So I do the six. And typically what happens is I start marching inward, right? That's what I do with the six. But what you do is instead of turning left, go back home. So let me do that here. So I come here and now I would have turned here, but instead of turning here, I go back home. So that is the very simple description of how you do it. And the key is do not lift your pen or pencil rather and draw it in one smooth operation. So if you stop and decide what to do, then it will not be continuous. It won't look smooth. So no matter how it looks like, even if you don't, don't your hand is not steady, it doesn't matter. So you can draw a little one. All Paisley's are beautiful. So don't worry about it. You can draw a, a, a little longer one if you like. So you can see, in one smooth operation, pretend you're writing the number six and that's pretty much it. And those who want to draw it, it, it a little bit backwards so you can do the same thing, you know, uh, inverted six is that pretty much it. So you can see, think of number six, start at the tip. Remember, start at the tip, go down and then when you are here, you are being creative, right? So you are saying, I want to take the road back home. This is home. How do I do that? Maybe somebody may do it this way. Somebody else may draw it a little bit differently, but you can make any variation that you like. You can make a smaller one, you know, or a left-hand side one, but that's pretty much it. All right. So take away from this is you're drawing the number six, one smooth operation. So continuous draw, don't stop and start. And draw outside first, and then also you can draw some left-hand patterns. All right, so keep practicing. Next part was how slender or how wide. Not all Paisleys are born alike, and some people prefer very tall and not as wide. So you'll see uh, in the extreme left here, there is a height to width ratio of about four to one. It's four units tall and one unit wide. And then there is three to one, two to one, and even 1 1.5 is to one. That means height is one and a half unit and width is only one unit. All Paisley's are good. The way I think about this is when you draw a long and narrow one, what you do is at the bottom, turn around a little quickly. So now you get a thin one. If you don't turn around very fast, very fast, so you, you kind of go wider, it becomes wide. So if you turn around a little sooner, you have plenty of time to kind of reach your destination. So you just draw it very smoothly, getting narrow and narrow. That's a slim one. I actually like the middle of the road kind. To me, aesthetically, they look the nicest to me. Oops, sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, and if it is too short and stout, they're also okay but uh, they lose their form. So I'm not gonna say which is the best. Everybody has their preferences, but that's another thing to practice. Slim versus wider. All right, now let's take a step forward and I'm gonna try to be a little bit more artistic and I'm gonna start with a little bit wider hook to begin with. So remember, 
normally I would draw the Paisley like this. But for now, I'm going to start with a longer hook. So, uh, sorry, they didn't come out perfectly, but you get the idea. There you go. So now you have a taller hook. So the secret is don't make the hook very, very, very sharp, you know, then it is very difficult to do it. Uh, it doesn't look as good. So make it nice and wide. So, and then slowly as you reach this destination, you tighten. So now you get a, 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 a little curled tip paisley and you can make this as large as you like. So here is one where it's almost bent over. All right, so that's a curled tip. That's all right, be creative. You can draw it on the left or right. Just with the tip, you can be very creative. And again, these were some ideas that I could come up with. You can do even better than me. So for example, start with a little curl. Right, so this doesn't go all the way to the end. So let me make another effort here. Right, there's one or just a gentle one. So it doesn't go all the way to the end. Sometimes people even leave it open. So how about that? Or you could start with a little spiral, you know, a little dot, you know, you have that. There's one more. Or you want a circle at the end, so. Ah, that didn't come up right, okay. So drawing on a screen is a little bit harder, but you can see even the tip can be very creative. So go for it, try whatever comes to your mind. All right. Now let's do something a little bit more complicated. So now you have the border and what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an inside border. And I draw attention to this left-hand side plot as a simple border. This is by far the most common. You could create a border and then fill it in or, or uh, hash it or something like that. But uh, I found this to be the most uh, you know, uh, simple and, and you can do many more things with it. So. Of course, you'll have your outside. And then typically with a sharper pencil or a lighter pencil, you just draw a little border. Oops, you can see my control on the screen is not very good. That's all. And the trick is the inner edge at the inner border has to be a little finer and lighter than the outside one. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm describing what is the goal of this border. The goal of this border is so that on this inside area, you can fill it. That leaves behind a little, you know, like a, like a road. It's like a beach on an island where there will be no pattern. So now you'll have an outside, a light inner border, and then you'll fill it on the inside. That leaves behind a contrast. So at the outer edges, it's like, it's like a ring road, which is blank. So it gives the art a little bit more of a lift. That's the whole idea. So um, very simple, you draw the outside and then with a finer uh, pen, you know, or, or a lighter touch, you, you kind of draw the outline, you know, leaving a little bit of border. Oops, that's what basically it. All right, now let's see what happens after you have drawn the border. Let's fill the inside. This is the most creative part of making your own unique Paisley design. So let's look at that. So how do you fill the inside? Well. If you have a border or not a border, you can draw whatever you like on the inside. So for example, you may use lines or hash marks. You can draw some uh, you know, rainbow-like patterns. You could have bubbles. You could have bullseye. You can have any pattern known to mankind. So it all depends on your creative energy. So for example, if you like rainbows, so yeah, okay, you draw your rainbows. Right, or maybe you, you have a border. So let's draw a little border and uh, let's see, I'm gonna write the letter W. There you go. So it took about 30 seconds. 
and the sky is the limit. You can fill any pattern you like. Those who are into shading and, and, and zen tangles, you can create a million patterns with it. So I call these kind of patterns uniform fill. That means the hole on the inside is, 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 is filled with the same kind of pattern. And when I give you the handout, you, you, you will see, uh, I'll give you a handout very soon and, and you will see that uh, uh, there are some more suggestions for that. Okay, non-uniform fill, that means on the hole on the inside, it's not the same. So for example, you'll see here, there's a little outside outline and then small, uh, bubbles and inside they are hashed in different directions. This looks like a leaf. This looks like the, you know, a, a certain kind of leaf with the, a certain kind of uh, veins and scales or, you know, this kind of pattern. I, I love this pattern. You know, this is something I, 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 I was practicing and it's very easy. You draw, you start at the bottom. So you just go back, forth and back and forth and back and forth. 30 seconds, you have a Paisley pattern. So these are non-uniform fill patterns and you can do whatever you like in here. So this was the, I'm gonna say very basics about the, 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 the demo that I wanted to kind of uh, cover. And uh, with a little bit of practice in about a week's time, you can get very good at it. And no, I guess skills are needed, you practice, you draw the outline, you get the outline a little smaller, wider, et cetera, et cetera. And then you practice the fill patterns. And what will happen is in about five minutes time, as this uh, session wraps up, you will get a PDF worksheet that I created. This PDF worksheet, a worksheet is for you to take away. You can click the link. It will be shared in the chat in about five minutes. And when you click it, it will appear. You can download it. You can print it. I suggest you, you print it and then it's almost like a practice sheet. You see some pictures, you saw, you draw it, and it sparks some imagination. So uh, look forward to that in, 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 in just a couple of minutes. Okay, few other tips. Uh, I find uh, many artists, uh, they want to take many Paisley patterns and fill a, a region. So for example, let's just say I draw a large Paisley. And now I want to fill this with small paisleys. Let's say, and I'm just making this up here as an example. So I'm filling this up small, big and all that. You might then say, hey, in some cases I want to do an upside down or left or right or whatever. How do I do it? My hand is not as skilled. It's very easy. You turn the paper around, maybe you face it upside down or to the left and you can draw it. After a few days, you will get very good that you can draw it forwards and backwards. But the easy thing to do is you want an inverted Paisley, so let me try mine. Okay, it's not too bad. And I would say I have reached this level of experience in about a week. So I'm no means an artist. Uh, I just got interested in this and as part of the session, I practiced and you can see within a few days, you can get pretty good at it. Some more complicated fill patterns. So here I try to be a little bit creative. So you can see, let me just keep my uh, cursor on. So you can see this whole pattern was divided into two. This got shaded one way, this got shaded another way. Very simple. Here's one, <clears throat> excuse me, one inside the other and some regions shaded differently. A little upside down with a little, little, little spiral at the end. Here is like a, a tornado inside or something like that. And uh, this is also a very common technique. You will see there was a border made and the border divided the region into two areas. This had one pattern, this had another pattern. Here's a, a, a floral touch, you know, some leaves and, and uh, sorry, some, some plants popping up from the bottom, uh, a friendly heart here. So these are some examples. And as I said, sky's the limit. I think our audience is very creative and they can take it in any direction they like. Now, uh, as another little uh, creative touch, uh, if you have the Paisley pattern, uh, you can take that general shape and do more things with it. So what do I mean by that? For example, the Paisley pattern, res uh, the Paisley outline resembles a few other things in nature. So, I just thought about it for a moment and I said, okay, let's, let's do a couple of more, uh, let's just say uh, off the left field uh, sort of ideas. So let's share a couple. 
here's a fish. So you can see the Paisley pattern is upside down and by drawing some scales and a little mouth and <laughs> it's not perfect, but uh, you know, you get the idea, here's a fish. Here's something that maybe is like a bud, uh, hasn't uh, bloomed yet. Uh, you can see, you know, and again, you can experiment with thicker lines and finer lines. So be creative. And here's a little cute birdie with some wings. So you can draw those. So it's a paisley shape and a little beak. And if you want to get more fancy with birds, you can draw all kinds of birds with it. Uh, you know, birds with, uh, um, you know, tall legs, short legs, uh, patterns and whatnot, uh, sky is the limit. So uh, final gentle reminders on, on things. So remember, use pencils or uh, I'm going to say, use something where you have some friction between your, your writing mechanism and paper. Uh, avoid very smooth ballpoint pens as a beginner. And the outline is the most important. Uh, just practice that. And in one smooth stroke, no stopping and going. Uh, you got to be in one smooth stroke. Yeah, I talked about that. And uh, so remember the Paisley outline is like drawing the number six. You start way up here, you go down, you kind of come up here. And from here on, you can take whatever journey you like. You can bend inwards, you can go a little bit straight, you can make it wider. So this last part of reaching home in your own elegant way is the creative part of making different shapes. And of course you can fill inside and outside and have fun. And this is something you can do it. Your six year old can do it. Your 99 year old grandmother can do it. So if you have grandma, grandkid time, you want to do three generations together, absolutely go for it. Something great that the whole family can enjoy. And remember the story of how Paisley came about. It started in India, but now everybody around the world enjoys it. And I hope you also get to enjoy drawing these patterns in your free time. So that was it. Now I will have Justin uh, share with you uh, the link uh, on, on the chat uh, window that he's going to just upload it there. But uh, this brings the, the session to a conclusion. Thank you very much for joining. And if there are any questions, I will field them now. So Justin, do you want to please uh, share, your, share that in the link so that the audience can uh, perhaps um, uh, you know, uh, yep. grab it? Yep, the uh, link's shared. It is posted now in the Zoom chat. Feel free to click on that. And we had one question in regards to where the uh, recording for this session will be, as well as previous recordings. Uh, that link is now posted just after that as well. That's uh, on our website, our web series page for Discover India series. You can find this and the other previous links there as well. Yes, excellent. So thank you, Justin. So hopefully uh, everybody had some fun. They learned a new skill. So please download that uh, sheet. It's got two, three pages on it. It's got a few more ideas and it's very simple. So print it out. You can draw next to it or you can keep that as notes. So I hope you enjoyed it. Very good, and thank you again, Vineet. This was a lot of fun, and I did some drawings to myself in my Paisley so I can get the curvature done, but. <laughs> <laughs> that came out awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Um, our next session for Discovery India's India series, as I mentioned, is next Monday night, the night at 7 p.m. again. We'll be just talking about the Bengal tiger. So do feel free to join us there and we hope to see you then soon and be sure to click your link for the pdfs here uh, we give some time for everyone to do so and if any other questions feel free to send them on our way otherwise have a good night everyone <laughs>